Thank you. So it's probably safe to say that uh, most TED audience members have likely never worked a blue-collar job. But I'd be willing to bet there's even fewer tech entrepreneurs and video game developers that have either. So blue-collar work is where people are working on the surface or underground, near or in large machines, extracting the resources or building the infrastructure we all use. And let's face it, most of the Western youth are not even considering these important jobs because they can be, see, can be seen as dangerous, physically demanding, is far less engaging, and downright hard and boring when compared to the addictive aspects of video, game and, video games and social media that so many partake. And video, game, video games have developed tremendously over the past couple of decades, probably to become the most engaging medium, more so than movies, books, or TV. Now, I remember even two decades ago, it's quite addictive. I used to have my then-girlfriend, now wife, keep my video game stash away from me during my graduate uh, work until I completed a certain number of pages of my master's or PhD. <laughs> it was a success, though. The rough draft of my dissertation was 900 pages. My uh, advisor wasn't too happy about that because he had to review it. But uh, anyway, the, the uh, most inf impactful experience I had um, working a blue-collar job was when I was an underground hard rock uh, laborer uh, in an Arctic lead-zinc operation called NanoCivic in the mid-1990s. Now, to give you an idea of the remoteness of this operation, it's 500 miles north of the Arctic Circle, at the northern tip of Baffin Island. At the time, in the mid-90s, Magnetic North was actually to the west of us. So uh, I started work uh, in mid-January, and at, at that time of year, it had been dark for months, and it would continue to be dark for several more months. Average temperatures were minus 45 degrees Celsius, that's minus 50 Fahrenheit, but the wind chill, it dipped down to minus 100. Now, Fahrenheit or Celsius doesn't matter, we call that cold. <laughs> I had many different jobs from uh, cleaning up around the crusher, uh, to operating it, uh, to loading explosives, uh, but uh, the work was boring. So boring, in fact, the miners like to tell of a story of how the senior crusher operator in the opposite shift fell asleep, fell into the crusher, emerging through the conveyor belt and surviving. Both times. <laughs> the, probably the most mind-numbingly boring job for me was driving this 50-ton haul truck underground. Now, I took this photo on surface uh, in April after the sun had finally come up, and I was refueling it there. Uh, but just to give you an idea of this job, uh, you essentially pick up a load from uh, an underground excavation area called uh, a stope. You drive up an inclined tunnel called a ramp. You dump into a crusher, still underground, and, and head back down for another load. The full cycle could take up to an hour. And just the headlights shining into the pitch dark tunnel with only a few feet on either side, and nothing but the vibrations and sound of a large diesel engine rocking you to sleep. All right. Many times I would nick and scratch that truck, but that's a pretty good wake-up call. The, the mine ran two shifts. So on the opposite shift, you essentially would share that truck with a guy on the opposite shift. And sometimes you'd walk into your cab and find mess and other mystery mess that you couldn't quite identify in the cab. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, so for something more exciting, I volunteered for the most dangerous activity, and this is called scaling. This is where you enter into a freshly blasted area, and in there, there's a lot of loose rock hanging from the back, and the ceiling is in mining what we call the back. And what, you're, what you do is you're lifted up to this back, which can be anywhere from 40 to 30 feet high, and using a five-foot-long crowbar, you knock that loose rock, loose rock down. Now, what made this job so good, so compelling, is that you could clearly see as you were making progress, knocking that loose rock down, and see that space being cleared up, and once in a while you can get a bonus. This is when you get to knock down a couch-sized boulder and watch a crash below you. It was so satisfying. <laughs> Dangerous, but not boring. Now, some key lessons I learned from that experience, and others I had before and since, was the sheer inefficiency and ineffectiveness of motivational tools. 
We'd never receive any feedback on how we were doing, except maybe a month, once monthly report of how many tons we had moved, or a daily yelling at from your frontline supervisor. We'd also, um, we also didn't know how our team was faring. And we also didn't know if we were mastering our craft, if we were getting any better, because we had no detailed feedback. The work was also isolating because you're in your machine all day long by yourself. So there's no means of social interaction throughout the day. But even though mining really is like a team activity, it's like having a construction site where you're building a hole for 30 years. So over, over the next five years, I had many different mi experiences in mining. But at that point, I was moving from mines that I was working at in northern Ontario to become a professor at the University of Arizona here in Tucson. My research was to specialize in data mining of mining data. <laughs> yeah. Now, once established, I also started an IT services company, largely to gain inroads with the U.S. mining industry and to get access to their data. Now, a key thing we noticed from our customers was that the managers and most of the people at the mine were not really using the data they were generating. So we had to find a way of making using data addictive. And those mines at the time were generating ever more data than they ever had before because they were installing very expensive technology on all their machines to track productivity and to coordinate. Uh, and a key thing as well was that the miners hated that technology. They saw it as evil big brother watching them all day long because only the managers would get access to that data. Think of it this way. Imagine wearing a fitness tracker where only your health insurance company or your spouse had access to the data. <laughs> so a breakthrough came when we, um, when we started to associate a point score to the key performance indicator. That's the, the measures of performance. Now, what uh, made this so revolutionary was that it allowed the highly competitive managers to compete, even though they were in different departments. For example, the haulage manager they were responsible for, uh, or their measure was tons. This was the number of tons all the truck drivers and shovel operators moved in the previous day. Now this tonnage metric isn't easily compared to the maintenance manager who's measured on something called availability. This is the percentage of time the machines are available to be worked, as, as, in, as in not in the maintenance shop. It's a measure of the effectiveness of the mechanics that, that, that are under the manager. So tons and availability not easily compared. However, when we awarded points, if they reached a particular threshold, we had a, a definitive comparative measure which would, they could compete. And those groups of reports, those scorecards, could be reviewed in a scorecard meeting. But a key element of that meeting was how, as the managers were walking in, they'd be teasing each other and laughing each other and sort of joking around as to who got more points the previous day. So eventually we created scorecards for managers at all levels, from the department manager to the frontline supervisor, even to some of the operators. Now, with that, they loved the detailed feedback because they could tell if they were mastering the craft. They loved the competition. We gamified both production and safety data. But uh, so uh, data utilization went from being negligible to being instrumental to running the business and for motivating the workers. So um, just as we were learning the value of gamification, everything changed for us. All of a sudden, uh, tablets began to come out, packed full of sensors and communications technology, a strong processor. It allowed us to track what people were doing in the field and interact with them. As well, we had IoT. These are uh, Internet of Things, small wearable sensors that could track more about the real world at a much lower cost than we ever could before. And another key aspect was software design. App developers are really focused on user engagement, at keeping someone engaged and addicted to the app. I'm sure some of you have experience from your phones. And um, a touchscreen interface that made uh, interface design so simple, anyone could do it without any sort of training. So finally, we'd be able to create a, a, a tool to interact with the people in the field, not just the managers. So many companies set out to develop a, um, a surface and underground uh, uh, productivity and safety tracking app using uh, uh, tablets and IoT, but a key element I wanted to include was gamification. 
So I had to reflect on my own sort of addiction in the past at the, what made video games so addictive? So I reluctantly told my wife, sweetie, I have to play video games. It's for research. <laughs> so likely the most addictive video game I've ever played is a, a game called Civilization. It's a turn-based strategy game where you guide settlers in the Stone Age all the way to the Space Age. Now what made this game so addictive is that throughout the game, you always have a feeling of accomplishment because there's all these pop-ups and little alerts telling you, oh, you just founded a city. Oh, you just researched the wheel or gunpowder. So it gives you a constant sense of feedback through accomplishment. Now I can tell you many times, my wife would catch me at four in the morning, shaking me out of my stupor, my suddenly, sudden realization I've been playing all night and that I've had to go to the bathroom for the past four hours. <laughs> now, taking this back to mining, I could be driving my truck for 10 long hours and get no feedback at all. The only thing I would look forward to at the end of an hour-long cycle was clicking the little tally machine that would count the load. However, with this new technology, we can provide feedback to, to the operators throughout their shift. We can give them points for filling out their safety forms properly and on time, for starting their shift on time, for not speeding, for being productive. Many points and awards are possible. Another favorite type of game of mine are first-person shooter multiplayer battlefield games. We're online, two teams square off against each other in big maps of 32 to 64 players. Now these games are designed around teamwork and military tactics. So older, more coordinated players can sometimes beat younger players with perfect thumb-eye coordination. These games are also about uh, the social experience because online you can join into squads within the team of up to five players and communicate through a microphone and coordinate. And you also need know how your team and squad is faring because there's various feeds that go on in this game that tell you how you're doing. And of course, you also have your own personal feeds that tell you as you're doing something helpful like downing enemy players or, or other things. Now, as my boys were getting old enough, I was very much looking forward to them joining my squad because then I could order them around as a team. <laughs> because these games really manipulate the players into cooperating as a squad and team by awarding very high points for being helpful. Things like repairing the, the tank or a boat that your teammate is in or reviving a squad mate. So there's lots of different opportunities there for, um, for cooperation. And at the end of the game, awards are announced. Now, these are ribbons and medals and other sort of feedback. Now, and you get these ribbons if you're especially helpful. This is a clear indication that you are mastering your craft. Scoreboards are also displayed. And this engenders both a sense of competition and cooperation because you can see where you rank within your team and you want to be the best, but also cooperation because you want to beat the other team. It's also a social experience because you are on your microphone and you can talk with your squad about different strategies on how to improve in the next round. So once, now that my boys are old enough, I'm very glad that they're on my team. One, because they have perfect thumb-eye coordination, so they typically rank as some of the top players in the game, but they're also super helpful because I'm barking orders at them, repairing the tank I'm in so that they can, um, so they can keep their daddy uh, alive a little bit longer. Now, taking this back to mining, um, your crew is like your gaming team. The best crews are the ones that, are, that cooperate and help each other and that are well-coordinated. And you can have um, scoreboards also displayed uh, in, these, in, in these areas because when, when miners or other people or the blue-collar workers typically get off work, you go by sort of a, a rousting area called a wicket. And they can see where they rank in, in the scoreboard. And they can also tease and joke and laugh about it with each other, making the end of the shift an experience, a social experience. Now, um, another thing that you have to watch out for is that sometimes miners, even today, can sabotage the incoming crew just for the sake of competition. They might hide machines or key tools and so forth. <laughs> So to correct this, though, another type of very engaging um, uh, social 
feedback as possible, and that's reviews. These days, I would never buy a product or hire a service without first reading this, uh, the review. And I guarantee you, the manufacturers of those products and the service providers read those reviews religiously to find ways to improve. So what we can do for miners that are incoming, they can give stars and another feedback on their, on their safety reports that could be read by the outgoing crew the next day. Now, I wish I had that capability because of the many times I'd walk into a, a disgusting truck cab or into a workplace full of safety issues and clutter. Now, no matter where we bring this technology, from the highlands of Peru to the jungles of Ghana, as soon as we introduce gamification and show them how it works, they immediately start to ask, oh, how can I get more points? And they started teasing each other right there in front of us of who's going to get more points. So these concepts are truly universal. Now, uh, there's a lot of other things about video games that I haven't reviewed, but key to my own personal experience are frequent feedback and the social aspects of teams and reviews, and detailed feedback on top of that to really know that you're mastering your craft. Now, as IoT uh, becomes more uh, adapted for blue-collar work, and if we take the data coming off larger, smarter machines, we can provide ever better feedback uh, for, for the blue-collar worker. And this doesn't only apply to mining. This could apply to far more dangerous activities, like construction, forestry, and even agriculture. The, blue, the, the incoming generation of blue-collar workers expect a better work experience. And now, technology coupled with design, we can deliver. Thank you.